Okay. So, so far up to this point, we've discussed natural selection. We've talked about mutation being the ultimate source of variation in populations, of new variation in, in populations. We've talked about population genetics and calculating genotypic and allelic frequencies. And we've also talked about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and this idea of what, what does a population look like in the distribution of genotypic and allelic frequencies when there's no evolution of population. So today we're gonna to explore the things that cause a population to evolve or go out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. The exceptions to these sort of assumptions. So natural selection, mutation, migration, smaller population sizes or something called genetic drift, in non-random mating. So Hardy-Weinberg assumes that none of these things are happening. Look, we're gonna talk about what each of these things are and why it breaks the sort of assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So we're gonna talk about natural selection, genetic drift, something called gene flow, mutation, and non-random mating. So one, two, three, four, five major things that cause a population to evolve or go out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And something that I wanna point out about these things is that natural selection of all these things that causes adaptation. So we've discussed adaptation, the noun as a heritable trait that increases fitness in a given environment. But adaptation can also be a verb, which is the proliferation or spread of that trait within a population, okay? So natural selection will increase advantageous alleles or genotypes or traits and reduce the disadvantaged alleles, disadvantage, and disadvantageous alleles or genotypes in a population. So natural selection causes adaptation. It causes the spread of these advantageous traits in a population and thereby the alleles and genotypes that are associated with those traits. These next three, genetic drift, gene flow, and mutation, I haven't talked about what they are yet, but I want you to know before we even get into them that these do not directly cause adaptation. So these will not select for advantageous traits. They will not select for advantageous alleles. They will not select for advantageous genotypes. All of these things are random changes in alleles or genot genotypic frequencies in a population, okay? So who survives and what alleles change in a population over time because of genetic gene flow or mutation are completely random. It's not because they have some selective advantage. In a non-random mating, typically you don't have adaptation. So typically you're not selecting individuals that have some advantageous trait, but occasionally it can lead to adaptation. And we'll discuss the sort of nuances of that. Okay, so first I just wanna talk about natural selection. We've talked about it a million times before. We spent an entire lecture talking about it. Um, we talked about this example in Blueville. We have population one, the predator comes in eats all the individuals that aren't blue and rend in, uh, blend in with the environment, and then mostly blue individuals with this AA or the big A alleles proliferate in the population. And we stress that natural selection acts on phenotypes or physical appearance, not on genotypes. So this predator can't see the genes. It can't see that this blue individuals have big A alleles. All it can see is that blue individuals are blue, and therefore it's not as good it's seeing them and it doesn't eat them as much. So it doesn't care about the genes that they have or the alleles that they have. It cares about what those individuals look like. So natural selection acts on phenotype, not genotype. And in general, natural selection reduces the frequency of what's called del deleterious alleles or mutations. And all those are, are those that cause a decrease in fitness in a particular environment. So in this case, if you have those little a alleles, you're gonna be red or purple. Those are deleterious traits or deleterious alleles in this particular population at this particular time because it causes individuals not to blend in with the population. And it increases the frequency of advantageous alleles or mutations or traits or those that increase fitness in a particular environment. So in this case, having the big A alleles and being homozygous dominant for that trait, you're blue, you blend in better, and there's selection for those advantageous alleles within the population such that those big A's are increasing in population number two. And as we said before, this leads to adaptation or a spread of these heritable traits that increase fitness in this given environment. So we see a proliferation of that blue trait and a proliferation of those big A alleles that are associated with it. So those individuals that survive are not random. There's adaptation occurring here. Or those with 
advantageous traits are surviving and reproducing more. And we see examples of adaptations all throughout nature. So whether you've got these trapdoor ants that have evolved this adaptation that they can sort of plug up these holes to plug up and protect the nests where their eggs are laid. Um, so they sort of act like a trap door, letting individuals in that they want and keeping individuals or predators out that they don't want. Or you see crazy traits like this octopus that's moving around over here where it has these special melanophores that are allowed to change color and blend in really well. Or these orchids here that have evolved to look exactly or very similar to female bees to attract the male bees that will pollinate these orchids. You can see here, an example of a predator that uh, has these adaptations to basically blend in really well with flowers so that it can capture uh, pollinators when they come in to pollinate the flowers. And this caterpillar here, this thing in the corner, it may look like a snake. This is actually a species of caterpillar that's evolved so that its head looks like a snake head so that birds won't come and eat it. So this is the head of the caterpillar right here. This is the butt end of the caterpillar right here. And so these are all examples of pretty cool adaptations that natural selection has selected for. And you can see that there's obvious reasons that those traits would be selected for to help in the survival of the orchids. Now, in general, there's three major types of natural selection, stabilizing, directional, and disruptive. So stabilizing basically just selects for the middle value of a trait or it selects towards the average. Directional selection, selects for an extreme value of a trait in one direction. So either like, you know, taller individuals or maybe it could go in the other direction, shorter individuals, but it only goes in one direction. And then you also have disruptive. So disruptive is basically those individuals with the sort of median or average value of a trait are selected against and those in extreme values are selected for. So just looking at these in a little bit more detail, starting with directional selection. Basically you have a trait changing in one direction. Um, so a great example of this is size and swifts after a deep freeze. So what happened was those birds that had larger bodies were able to survive uh, a really hard cold winter and kept from freezing. And so individuals with smaller body sizes froze and died. Those with larger body sizes that we're looking at here in the bottom. So here you're just looking at body size class. And here you're looking at the percentage of birds in each of those size classes. And you can see that non-survivors after that freeze had a much smaller body size versus survivors had a much larger body size. And so you see a shift in the average size of individuals in the population overall. So this is directional selection for larger bodied individuals and against smaller bodied individuals. And so the trait changes, the trait of body size is changing in one direction towards a larger body size. And this can reduce the overall genetic variation for a trait in a population. So in this case, the population used to have a range in sizes going from one all the way to 12. And after the selection event, we basically got only individuals from six to 12. And so we've got an overall reduction, assuming that this trait is associated with um, genes or different alleles in the sort of size alleles that are available in the population after that selection event. And once again, you've got adaptation. So an advantageous trait increases in its proportion in the population. In this case, birds uh, body size. So another general type of natural selection is something called stabilizing selection. Um, and stabilizing selection, essentially what you have is selection reducing extremes um, on both sides of the sort of average distribution. A great example of this is baby size. Um, and so if you have a very, very small birth weight, um, typically you have much higher mortality um, in babies um, simply because they're born too prematurely and they can't survive. Or if you have a really, really large baby, oftentimes you have complications with birth as well. And so you have selection for medium-sized babies or towards the average. And so this is called stabilizing selection where individuals at the extremes of, in this case, birth weight, so really heavy and really light babies are selected against and sort of average size babies are selected for. And this once again can reduce the overall genetic variation for a trait in a population. So you should have selection against these extremes of very light birth weights and very heavy birth weights. And once again, 
you're having this lead to adaptation. In other words, an advantageous trait, in this case, an average birth weight should increase in the percentage of the population. And those individuals with very extreme birth weights should be selected against. The last type I wanna discuss of natural selection is disruptive selection. So in this case, you're favoring extreme phenotypes. So for example, here we can look at these African seed cracker birds and their beak, beak length and the number of individuals that are surviving from generation one generation to the next. Um, and in this case, you've got two seed sites available. So this is similar to the example that we looked at with the Galapagos finches. Um, but in this case, basically you have small beaks who are able to specialize on smaller seeds and you have large beaks who are able to specialize on those larger seeds. And they're actually favored in times when there's not a lot of seeds available because the smaller beaks are able to outcompete individuals with medium sized beaks for those smaller fruits. And individuals with larger beaks are able to outcompete those individuals with medium sized beaks for the larger seeds. And so you have selection against average size individuals and selection for individuals with either really small beaks or really large beaks, those extremes of the phenotypes. And so this can actually increase the overall genetic variation for a trait in a population because you get selection for those extremes. Um, it, and this of course leads to adaptation or an increase in advantageous traits in a population. But in this case, you can have two extremes, an increase in the small beaks in this case and the large beaks. And this can actually lead to speciation. And we'll discuss what that means in a future lecture. But suffice it to say that this can actually make it so that these birds become so, so, so different over time that they actually become different species. So that is natural selection. Now let's talk about genetic drift. So genetic drift are random changes in allele frequency from generation to generation. And these random changes have nothing to do with the allele effects on an individual's ability to survive and reproduce. So those alleles that get passed from generation to generation in genetic drift are just random by chance. It has nothing to do with any advantageous trait associated with those alleles. And we see genetic drift most often in small populations. And we see it most often with alleles or mutations that are neutral. Neutral in the sense that they don't have any effect on an organism's fitness. They don't have any real effect on its phenotype or its ability to reproduce from generation to generation. So if we look at genetic drift in an individual population, so this graph that we're looking up here on the top. And here what we're looking at is just a simulation of a population over time from zero generations all the way up to 100 generations. And we're looking at the frequency of alleles, in this case a neutral allele that has no effect on an organism fitness over time. And so you can think of this as zero means that allele is completely lost from the population and one as in that's the only allele for this trait in the population. And what you can see is over time, when we're looking at a population with four individuals in it, when we go from a population size or that starts off with an allele frequency that's half one allele, half the other allele, over time, that allele becomes fixed in the population. So when we say fixed in the population, what we mean is it's the only allele left in the population. So it becomes only big A in the population. Whereas the other version of that allele, so the little a in this case, becomes completely extinct from the population or is eliminated from the population. So over time, what we're seeing and in the small population, and this is just a simulation or a single simulation of one population, that allele becomes fixed in the population. And if we do a bunch of simulations with a population size of four individuals, so each of these lines represents a different simulation, of the effective drift on a population. When I see a simulation, what I'm saying is, we just randomly say, we're gonna choose which of those four individuals reproduce and make offspring in the next generation. We're gonna randomly choose which individuals re reproduce and produce offspring in the next generation. And we repeat that over and over and over again for 100 populations. And what you see is when there's small population size, almost every single time or actually every single time, 
the allele either becomes fixed in the population or it becomes eliminated from the population. If we increase the population size, so let's say we crank it up to 40 individuals instead of four or 400 individuals instead of four and do these same simulations, what you see is genetic drift is less dramatic in those populations when you increase size. So only one or two or maybe three of those simulations go to fixation. So when I talk about drift, what I'm talking about is the allele frequencies in the population are randomly drifting to different frequencies. So remember that a change in allele frequency is evolution. And just randomly what's happening is the allele frequency in the population is changing or the population is evolving over time just by chance. This is called genetic drift. And we see that drift is way more pronounced as population size decreases. As population sizes get bigger and bigger, we see that this drift of the populations or these changes in the allele frequencies over time, that drift gets way less pronounced and we don't have fixation occurring as the population gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, so the big sort of take homes from these figures is that in smaller populations, they're much more susceptible to random changes in allele frequencies. They're much more susceptible to drift. And in larger populations, they're way less susceptible to drift. So if you're in a larger population, drift is way less likely. You're way less likely to have these random fluctuations or random changes in allele frequencies. So why is that? Why is it that larger populations are less susceptible to drift? And why is it that smaller populations are much more susceptible to genetic drift? So let's think about a population with four individuals. So one, two, three, four individuals. These are the genotypes of each of those four individuals. And this is the allele frequency in the population where the dominant allele represents half the alleles and the recessive allele represents half the alleles. And let's say just by some chance event, these three individuals end up reproducing in the next generation. And this individual does not reproduce in the next generation. This is purely by chance. It has nothing to do with any selective advantage that, that, in, that this individual has or these individuals have over this individual. Nothing to do with fitness at all. It just happens that just by chance, this individual dies or doesn't get to reproduce. Now, if we look at the allele frequencies in the population now, it's automatically shifted from 0.5 to 0.33 for Q and 0.5 to 0.66 for P just because this individual randomly dies. So this population has evolved just by chance. And there's been a big shift in the allele frequencies just because this one individual represented so much of the proportion of that allele in the population. Whereas if we look at a really large population, if we have one individual disappear from that population, it's not gonna have a big effect on the allele frequencies in that population because that individual doesn't represent as large a proportion of the alleles overall or the frequency of those alleles in the population overall. So it's gonna have way less of an effect. So that's why large populations are way less susceptible to this genetic drift and random fluctuations in a population. So this is one way that this idea of genetic drift or random fluctuations or changes in allele populations happen over time. This is this sort of random fluctu fluctuation random individuals are able to reproduce and you get these sort of random changes in allele frequencies over time. The other way it can happen is through founder effects or bottlenecks. So founder effects and bottlenecks are basically a few individuals from a large population colonize a new habitat. So this is a founder effect. So basically one pregnant animal lands on an island or one plant seed lands on an island and that individual brings its alleles with it to colonize the island and produce um, the subsequent population. You can also have something called a bottleneck. And this is basically just a really sudden constriction of population size typically caused by some sort of natural disaster like earthquakes, a flood, a drought, a fire, or just humans annihilating the habitat in a very short period of time. In either case, you're eliminating a bunch of the alleles in the population really, really quickly, reducing sort of overall allelic diversity in the population. So just to look at this another way, 
If we're looking at a bottleneck or a founder effect, essentially what you're looking at is you can think of this bottle as the parent population in all of these different colors representing different alleles in the population. And then some sort of bottleneck or founder effect occurs, okay? So for some reason, only a few individuals arrive at a new site or survive some catastrophe. And those individuals carry their alleles with them. And those are the only alleles, so this is the new founder population, those are the only alleles that are left over in the population. So you get a big change in the alleles that are present in the population in a very short period of time. And it's important to note that those alleles that make it through this bottleneck are random, okay? So it's not individuals that have a particular trait that gives them some sort of selective advantage. Those individuals that make it through this bottleneck are completely random. It has nothing to do with the actual traits that they have. It's just by chance that they happen to make it through that bottleneck. So an example of this might be a cheetah. Um, so you can see here the cheetah range in 1900. Um, they're spread most of, across most of Africa and the Asiatic cheetah across a lot of uh, Southern Asia. Since then, those populations have been reduced by about 90% uh, due to habitat loss and destruction. And so basically what's happening is um, that population is going through this intense bottleneck. And those individuals surviving are random individuals. It's not because they have particular traits that are allowing them to survive. And as a result, um, there's a huge drop in the genetic diversity of this cheetah population. So these species only have one or two alleles at many loci as a result. So there's a huge drop in the allelic diversity in the overall cheetah population. And this has really negative effects for the cheetah population because essentially now there's fewer alleles for natural selection to pick from. And if there's less genetic diversity and fewer alleles, there's few, less variation in the population. And that overall can inhibit this ability, the ability of this population to adapt to changes in the environment if there's not a lot of stuff for natural selection to pick from in the first place. So an example of founder effects. So we talked about um, bottlenecks. We also have these things called founder effects. So founder effects is essentially one individual is a pioneer that establishes a population. Um, a great example of this are these things called silver eye birds where they started out on the Australian mainland like you can see right here. Um, and then they went from the Australian mainland, they went and landed on Tasmania. So one individual established a population on Tasmania just randomly got sort of blown over there uh, in a storm. And then from Tasmania, another random individual was able to establish a population on New Zealand, so on and so forth. As you can see, new individuals founding new populations on different islands and different parts of islands. And if you look at the allelic diversity in the populations on each of those islands as you have new founders moving across these different islands, what you see is the allelic diversity as you move from each island decreases over time. And so that founder is bringing fewer and fewer alleles to the new population and that new population is based off those founders. So the alleles that make it through, there's fewer overall and also those that make it through, once again, are random it's not in because these individuals have some selective advantage that gives them a trait that allows them to establish these new populations. It's a random selection from the population. It's not associated with any particular trait that they have. And so overall, um, the allelic diversity decreases in the population. So I just want to reiterate that although genetic drift is evolution, because remember, evolution is a change in allelic or genotypic frequencies in a population over time. So drift, whether it's a founder effect, whether it's these random fluctuations, whether it's a bottleneck, represents a change in allelic frequencies or genotypic frequencies in a population over time. So this is an example of evolution, but it's not selection. Those individuals that survive and reproduce more and cause those changes in allele frequencies in a population are random. And so this does not result in adaptation. So those individuals that pass on their alleles, it's not because they have some selective advantage. All right, I know I'm covering a lot of material here, um, but we're gonna move on to the next thing, which is gene flow or migration. <clears throat> 
And all that gene flow is, is basically the transfer of alleles between two different populations. So you might imagine population A has their set of alleles, population B has their set of alleles, populations A and B mix with each other. So their genes flow in between the two populations or their alleles flow between the two populations. And you get population C that might have a greater amount of allelic diversity than the two populations individually, okay? So this tends to introduce novel alleles and in, can, can increase the overall allelic diversity in a population. Another important thing that gene flow can do is it can counteract drift and stop allele of fixation in a population. So you can imagine when we talked about genetic drift, if you have one, two, three, four populations, over time, if a lot of genetic drift is occurring, you can have fixation of alleles in a population. So maybe only the blue version of allele becomes fixed in this population and loses all the red versions of the allele. And vice versa in this one, all the blue versions of the allele got lost from the population. And so in this case, you've lost genetic diversity over time because of random fluctuations, because of this drift in the alleles over time. Whereas migration, if you've got individuals with red and blue alleles moving between populations continuously, it can stop that fixation from happening. So a red individual can move into this population and reintroduce that allele back into that population. And so it can counteract drift and also it prevents isolation and helps slows and stops um, something called speciation or the ability of these populations to become so different that um, they're no longer the same species. And we'll talk about how that works in future lectures. So I want to reiterate here that gene flow is a type of evolution in the sense that gene flow introduces random changes in the allele frequencies from generation to generation. And so if you have new alleles, so let's pretend these spiky frogs here have the spike frog allele and they introduce that allele into this population, that will potentially alter the allele frequency in that population. So by definition, that population is evolving. But what I'm saying is it's random, the alleles that come in here, it has nothing to do with any selective advantage of these spiky frog alleles. It's just a change in the frequency of alleles in a population due to the random introduction of new alleles. Okay, so this is not an example of adaptation. It's not due to any allele effects on the ability to reproduce and survive. And the genotypic frequency is not um, or I'm sorry, that change in genotypic frequency or that gene flow does not directly result in adaptation. So next I want to talk about mutation. So remember that mutation is just a random change in a DNA sequence or structure. And the example we used here was the DNA sequence for red blood cells, where you can get a single point mutation that gives, turns normal red blood cells. If you have a single point mutation in the nucleotides here, you can end up with sickled red blood cells. Okay, so one little mutation results in this sickle red blood cell type. So this is a random change in uh, DNA sequence or structure that results in this case in a change in phenotype. But I wanna point out that mutations don't always cause traits change, okay? So you don't always have a change in trait as a result of a mutation. Um, you can have mutations that do increase fitness or change a trait. You can have mutations that have no effect on fitness or neutral mutations that don't change a trait at all. You can also have deleterious uh, mutations that decrease fitness, okay? Or you can have mutations that just don't change fitness at all. So you can have advantageous, neutral or deleterious mutations. And whether a mutation is advantageous, neutral or deleterious in terms of its effect on fitness is also context dependent. Okay, so in some contexts, a trait might be very ad advantageous. In other contexts, that trait might not be advantageous at all. For example, the sort of silly example we use is Gortat being super tall is great when he's playing basketball, but not so great when he's driving a car. And the same thing can be sell said about sickle red blood cells. There's places where that can be advantageous to have that trait and other places where it's disadvantageous. 
And so mutations, if you introduce mutations into a population, you're by definition introducing new potential alleles into the population and by definition changing the allele frequencies in a population. And therefore, by definition, that population is evolving. But it's important to point out that although mutation is a type of evolution, mutation is not selection and it does not cause adaptation. So a mutation might introduce a new trait. So for example, if we look at these beetles here, you might have a mutation occurs that makes white beetles. But you're not gonna have adaptation until some selective pressure comes and selects for or against that mutation. So mutations can change allele frequencies in a population, but that change will be random. And it's only once natural selection pulls from those mutations or the traits associated with those mutations do we see adaptation. So mutations do not directly cause adaptation. That's what natural selection does. So the last exception I want to talk about for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is non-random mating, an example of which would be inbreeding. So Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium assumes that populations mate randomly or individuals in a population mate randomly. In non-random mating, individuals are preferentially chosen based on their genotype and the associated phenotype. So for example, in random mating, so you can have this AA individual and that AA individual has an equal chance of mating with any of these particular genotypes and the associated phenotypes in the population, okay? So from the perspective of this AA individual, whether you're a blue dot, a red dot, or a purple dot, everybody looks like Brad Pitt. You're equally sexy, okay? So there's no preferential treatment for any particular phenotype in the associated genotypes. This is what Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium uh, assumes is happening. So you have an equal chance of pulling any of those particular alleles out of the population when individuals are mating. In non-random mating, this blue individual has a non-equal chance of mating. And so some individuals, and this is just, I just randomly picked that the big A, big A individual that's also the blue individual is preferred by this big, uh, this blue individual. So this is the Brad Pitt of the litter. Whereas these other two individuals are not as attractive to this blue individual. So it's non-random who this blue individual chooses to breed with. So some individuals are sexier than others. And as a result, you'll get an artificial increase in these big A, big A individuals or this big A allele. So the idea here is that in random mating, you're gonna follow the predictions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. In non-random mating, you're not meeting the assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. You have a higher probability of blue individuals breeding with blue individuals, a higher probability of those egg and sperm combining, and certain genotypes and alleles are gonna increase in the population. So you're gonna get a shift or a change in allele frequencies over time as a result of those preferences. And a very specific example of non-random mating is something called inbreeding. And this is basically just mating with close relatives, okay? And we often find this in small or isolated populations. So this is more typical in smaller populations. And the big problem with inbreeding um, is that you tend to have recessive traits, and spe especially deleterious recessive traits um, pop up in the population as a result of inbreeding, and fewer uh, new and novel combinations of alleles. So you can think of relatives, for example, here that um, have a higher prevalence of this little a allele that's associated with some negative recessive trait, whereas non-relatives might have different versions of the alleles. So these only have the A versions of the alleles for this particular trait, whereas non-relatives might have Bs, they might have Cs, they might have Ds, but a lot of different allelic diversity in those non-relative individuals. And so what happens is you can have this thing called inbreeding depression, where essentially you're having expression of deleterious traits and reduced allelic diversity. And so if you have non-relatives breeding, you can get different allelic combinations and less chance of these re recessive, uh, negative deleterious recessive traits coming out. Whereas with this inbreeding scenario, you can have 
little a and little a alleles combining and having these bad recessive uh, diseases or traits more likely to appear and overall less allelic diversity. So th these are some of the not negative consequences of inbreeding, which is a type of non-random mating. And we see examples of this um, in the real world. <laughs> um, something in the Amish communities is something called Ellis Van Creveld syndrome. Um, and this is basically caused by being homozygous recessive for this rare mutation, EVC or EVC2. This is a particular gene and these are particular alleles of that gene. And you can see these different symptoms like short limbs, um, dwarfism, polydactyly, which is having extra fingers and toes, um, partial hair lip, cardiac malformations. So a lot of these potentially negative symptoms coming out um, because of the smaller population and non-random mating. And this has actually been traced all the way back um, to a couple immigrants, this guy Samuel King and his wife, who were um, some of the initial starters of the Amish population. So this is actually a combination of inbreeding within the Amish community as well as um, a founder effect where there's de decreased allelic diversity in the population to start with. Another example um, of inbreeding that we learned about and its effects for conservation um, are the Florida panther population. So they have a very small isolated population. Um, and because of that, uh, there's lots of inbreeding in those Florida panthers. And we see lots of deleterious alleles uh, basically showing up in the phenotypes of these panthers. So like the crooked tails, lots of diseases. So examples of allelic, um, I'm sorry, inbreeding depression and reduced allelic diversity. And that's why this genetic restoration te technique works so well. So by bringing those Texas pumas into the population, if you can remember back to this example that we did a few weeks back, that introduced new alleles into the population and helped restore some of the genetic diversity and get rid of some of the inbreeding depression that was happening in those Florida panthers. Okay, so I know I did a lot of talking. I just want to round off uh, this lecture with this idea that, um, you know, none of these things are happening independently to the gene pool uh, of a population. So remember, that's all the alleles in the population. It's not like only drift is occurring or only mutation is occurring or only gene flow is occurring. Natural selection, drift, mate choice, mutation, all this stuffing stuff is happening to populations, natural populations simultaneously. And all of these things are affecting the allelic and genotypic frequencies in a population. And so to say that a population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and all these assumptions are met is very, very rare if that ever actually happens in a real population. Um, but what Hardy-Weinberg does for you is says, this is what a population would look like if none of these things were happening and what the gene pool would look like if none of those things were happening. And if we can say that it's not, or the allele distributions, the allele frequencies and genotypic frequencies in a population are not meeting the assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, then one of these five things or several of these five things may be going on. <laughs>